Mark is a cornea person from Portland. And as most of y'all may or may not know, he's probably single-handedly responsible for the uh, success of the DSEC and DMEC procedure in the United States. He's been doing corneal surgery for probably close to 40 years. And I know that because we're about the same age. And um, he has a very successful practice out there, probably one of the most popular cornea fellowships in the country. And things that you don't know about Mark is that he was a basketball player at Yale, number one. Number two, he graduated first in his medical school class. And number three, he did a year in the Navy serving um, you know, around Asia and in the Pacific as a flight surgeon um, for reasons that he didn't necessarily anticipate going into the service. <laughs> uh, but I've known Mark for a long time and he is the consummate teacher. He's been awarded the Peyton Award by the iBank Association of America. The Cornea Society this year gave him the Klaus Dolman Award, which is the highest teaching honor um, that you can get. And he is a good speaker and we're lucky to have him here. So we'd like for y'all to please welcome Mark Terry. That was a really nice introduction. Thanks very much, Woody, I appreciate that. Um, it's really a pleasure. I've never been to Kentucky before. And uh, uh, this is really a delight to be here. And uh, I hope to get a chance to get to know the residents a little bit more as, after we have this hour here with you all. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk to you guys about uh, what's been my passion for the past 22 years. And that is uh, changing the way we do corneal transplantation uh, in a dramatic way, a paradigm shift. And um, I'm gonna kind of take you through the history of uh, corneal transplantation, but more importantly, I want to give you kind of a sense of um, what, how, do, how do surgeons change their minds about what they're going to do? And this applies not just to corneal transplants, but to cataracts and to glaucoma procedures. Um, <clears throat> why does a surgeon do what they do? Uh, what are the factors that make them decide to change their, their methods of taking care of their patients? And so that's kind of the theme of this, of this talk. But we'll also have some other, other stuff in there, too. So there's a little history, but there's also some lessons. And so this is uh, endothelkeratoplasty from corneal transplantation of PK to LEC to DSAC to DMEC. Um, let's see. So these are my disclosures. Um, I designed a bunch of instruments uh, through Bosch and Lohman, so I get a small royalty on that. And the amount I get each year might be able to buy a latte for each of you once. Okay. Um, then uh, I, I put on this, uh, uh, this uh, breakfast meeting every year at the academy called the Endothelial Keratoplastic Group. And this is a, a group that I founded about 20 years ago to explore new methods of corneal transplantation, especially in the field replacement. And so I get money uh, for that educational uh, meeting from Bosch and Lohm and Moria. And then uh, at the National Eye Institute, our one grant, I'm an associate investigator on that. And then um, uh, off-label use, uh, I'm going to be discussing Tripan Blue, SF6 Gas, and the Stryco Jones uh, Glass Two for uh, uh, Demec. So if you want to replace the endothelium, uh, the last 100 years before endothelial keratoplasty, all you had was corneal transplantation of penetrating keratoplasty. It's like saying the plaster on my, on my living room is, is, is not doing well. So I need to replace the plaster on my living room. So the way you would do that back before in keratoplasty is you would cut through the top of the house, take off the roof, take, up the up, take off the upstairs bedrooms, get all the way down to the living room and then take off the, the ceiling living room, then take off that part of the house and then put another top part of the house onto that. And now you've effectively replaced the plaster in your living room. Okay, and that's what penetrating keratoplasty was for replacing the endothelium. Let's just take out the whole cornea to get to that one cell layer in the inside of the eye, and that's how we can replace. It. And that's the way it was done for a hundred years. Okay, and um, you got great results. You got a beautifully clear cornea because uh, you could effectively transplant the endothelium, and it would be very effective, and you'd get a, a beautiful cornea. This is. Uh, a technique is a single running suture technique of replacing um, uh, the cornea, suturing it. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Van Meter is uh, uh, the one that uh, uh, spearheaded this over 20 years ago. And it's uh, still one of my favorite ways of doing a, a corneal transplant. And as it says there on the slide, you get a fantastic clear graft. 
2020 vision, <clears throat> minimal astigmatism while you have the suture in place. <clears throat> but as soon as you take the suture out, the only thing holding the transplant in place is the wound. And the wound has variable wound healing and compressive forces. And that's what determines your curvature of the cornea and the astigmatism. And so you take sutures out and it's anybody's guess what you're gonna end up with in terms of the focusing power of the cornea. So when you look at the visual results of a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty, the best final vision didn't really occur until all the sutures were out. And that would take about a year or two and even longer for some patients before they had adequate uh, uh, wound healing and scar tissue to hold the transplant in place. Most patients need to wear a hard contact lens for their very best vision, although some can wear glasses uh, and get good vision, but not their best vision. And it was extremely rare for a patient to have good vision without glasses or contacts. The rejection rate in most studies for penetrating keratoplasty, depending on which study you look at, um, is about 18% in the first two years. <clears throat> but what really bothered me as I was growing up in coronal transplantation, what really bothered me was the long-term liabilities that you endowed to the patient with a penetrating keratoplasty. You can do a fantastic job and you're patting yourself on the back. Oh, this guy sees great with glasses, 20-20 vision. But what happens if one of the sutures, fragments that are in the eye, they come to the surface and that's what happened on this one on the right. Um, you can see that this eye was doing well until all of a sudden the suture fragment gave them an infection. Now they got an endophthalmitis. And what about this patient of mine? These are both my patients. And um, this patient simply had a minor uh, blunt trauma to the eye five years after the transplant. The patient was 2020. And then they get an expulsive hemorrhage because they open up the wound. The wound is never heals. The wound never heals to the point where trauma won't open it up. And so if a person takes a fist to the eye or a fall, where is it going to open? It's going to open right where your wound is. It's not going to open in other places. That's where the weakest point is. So that's what bothered me the most about penetrating keratoplasty. But going even further on that, what do we do with a patient like this? This is a patient of mine, Paxton, this is his first name. Um, he had CHED, congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy. 18 month old toddler, terrible vision since birth. He'd never seen his mother's face clearly. And now he's got blisters and pain and he can't stand to be out in the sunlight. Not a good life for a toddler, right? Well, the solution to that in the old days was a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. Now, the 10-year success rate in this condition is less than 20%. These are little toddlers. The best vision is not achieved for six months or more. And by then, you get amblyopia. And then, you know, just fix his vision with a hard contact lens, right? I don't know how many of you have toddlers, but it's really tough to even get them to come to, you know, to eat something, much less put a contact lens in their eye. And so this is an older slide. For the first uh, uh, 20, uh, 18 years, I guess it was, of my transplant career, um, all we really had was full thickness. And um, it, 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 it was fine because that's what everybody else had done. That's what all my teachers had done and what their teachers had done, and what their mentors had done. Um, but it had all these frustrating uh, drawbacks. So this led to uh, the revolution in coronal transplantation of selective endothelial replacement, selective tissue replacement. And I'm going to take through the journey from DELEC to DESEC to DESEC to DEMEC. And that journey actually started here in the United States in Portland, okay. Oregon. Uh, I'll show you some of that. So these are uh, some OCTs of my patients um, showing the difference between a DELEC, a DESEC, and a DEMEC. <clears throat> a DELEC is a hand dissected donor. Uh, so you, you, you mount up a donor, uh, either whole eyeball in a cup, or you mount up the corneal scleral cap. And then you manually try and create a 100 micron thick uh, posterior layer by doing a manual section limbus to limbus. And then you cut that out and you do the same thing on the recipient. And then you just simply put this into the pocket you created, simply. And there's the sake. And the sake was a whole lot easier because with the sake, you no longer had to do a hand dissection of the recipient and cut out the back part of the cornea from inside the cornea. Um, you simply just stripped off Desmase membrane. And then you had a uh, donor tissue that was created with a microkeratome or a femtosecond laser, which didn't work so well, but a microkeratome. And so there wasn't this difficult dissection. And then finally, we come to Demac, and you can see Demac looks like a normal cornea because you're stripping off the membrane and you're putting the membrane back and it's perfect anatomic replacement. So 
back in back in the late 90s, uh, uh, question was asked, is there a better way than PK of replacing a single endothelial layer? And it was in 1998, the Dutch surgeon, Herod Mellis, showed that in the laboratory, the endothelial layer could be removed through a tunnel and replaced without sutures. He'd never done it in patients. But I read his article in Cornea, and I really caught on fire. But I also realized it wasn't going to be ready for prime time. So I, people say, okay, Mark, how did you ever come up with this idea of uh, development of this strange procedure, EK? And I can tell you exactly what it was. It was on December 8th, 1998, at the 2 a.m. feeding, okay? So my wife and I had, uh, had gone for years without children. We finally had twins, okay? So... We had the twins and what are you gonna do? You're first time parents and you don't know what the heck you're gonna do. And so we did decide to do shifts. So Cindy is a morning person, I'm a night person. So I would take the night shift until about three and then she would take it after that. And I'd sleep my three or four hours and go back to go to work the next morning. And what do you do if you're a corneal, a, a new cornea guy in the community? Well, uh, at 2 a.m., well, you you're feeding the babies, but then you also got to keep your mind going. So I would read my journals and catch up on the journals. And so I was reading this journal um, in cornea, uh, the cornea journal, and I, and I was going through and all these great articles. Then way in the back, there was this little laboratory study that was done by Garrett Mellis talking about how in eye bank eyes, he had uh, taken out the back layer and put a new back layer in there all with manual dissections and, uh, uh, and that the tissue stuck with an air bubble. And he did one primate, he did one monkey, and the monkey was able to get a clear cornea. Well, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm feeding these babies. I almost dropped Charlie on the floor. I literally almost dropped my kid on the floor. I said, oh my God, he's got it, okay? And just as an aside, why the hell did, excuse me, why the heck did the cornea people take so long to figure this out? The retina people had been putting in air and gas into the eye to hold the retina on place for years, okay? And yet cornea, it was not until two decades later that we figured out, well, we can put the endothelial layer in there and hold it in place with the gas, just like they hold the retina on. But that's so, I'm not gonna go into why cornea people are stupider than, than retina people, but uh, I, I could go on forever. Okay, so that was 1998 and, uh, so I was on fire, literally. I could not sleep the rest of the night. So I, I wrote down some stuff and I, and I thought, well, that, that instrument that he designed is not gonna work. Uh, we need something different. And so I went to the laboratory and I started fooling around with different instruments. And, uh, uh, and so I called Bosch and Loam and I said, uh, can, I, can I send you some drawings? And uh, they said, sure. And I said, all I, all I ask of you is that you get me a prototype within six weeks of each drawing I send you. And, um, and then, you know, I don't care what you do with, with selling these instruments uh, in terms of profits and that sort of thing, just get me my, my instruments. So the other thing I realized is that I was in a situation, even though I was in private practice, I wasn't at the university, but I had a great relationship with the Lions Eye Bank. It's called Lions Vision Gift now. And my relationship with them enabled me to obtain whole globes and, um, and corneas from them free of charge because they had research tissue available that could be used for transplantation. And so they had available for research, but they would give it to me free of charge to work on my, on, on developing the surgery. <laughs> and then I worked on at night and on weekends in a small minor surgery room. It wasn't even a laboratory. I call it a laboratory, but it was our minor surgery room in the clinic. And I tried to find out what worked. And, and most time, as I says there, I found out what didn't work. But what's fun about when you're developing something, um, you get you have a lot of latitude because it's not been done before, right? So you have a chance to kind of expand what you what you can do with this. And I thought, you know, um, when you're developing instruments, uh, you get to name them, okay? Uh, yeah, I can name them. So I looked back and I saw, okay, um, all these people have named all these instruments after themselves. You know, you've got the bear care of this, the bear care of that, you've got the, you know, whatever it is, they all name things after themselves. I thought, well, that's a good, good idea, but, but let's, let's reach beyond that. Let's, let's try something else. Let's honor the people that really count. So I decided to, uh, you know, first of all, rename the procedure because Melissa had named it posterior lamellar keratoplasty, and there were other things called PLK back then. So I said, it's got to have a, a new name. So I came up with deep lamellar endothelial keratoplasty, which is what described the procedure to lack. And then I got to name the uh, instruments. And you can see there, I've named the Cindy Scissors, the Charlie Forceps, the Nick Pick, and the Devers Dissector to honor my, um, the, 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 my uh, eye institute. 
Uh, and you can see one of those got crossed out because Cindy said, no way in heck you're going to be able to have that out there. The Cindy stripper, you know, I don't want to go to a meeting and have people look at me. So at any rate, uh, uh, it just didn't work. But the, but we kept it. And then, um, uh, you know, the, so all these instruments are, I still use these for uh, for other purposes, for other surgeries, because they work very well. Okay. So that's part of the fun part of doing the research. The hard part is that when you do come up with something, you've got to make it so that you can you can use this uh, uh, this this technique and have it work. So going going again on on what is a delec? It's where you make it a dissection all the way across, starting the sclera, because the whole idea behind this was no incisions, no sutures. Remember that picture I showed you—a ruptured globe and an infected because of sutures. The idea of the surgery was let's eliminate the problems with corneal transplantation, which is incisions in the cornea and sutures. So let's have no sutures and let's have no incisions, but let's transplant the corneal endothelium. So what you can do is you can go through the sclera, which is much stronger than the cornea. You can tunnel in and then you go in and you cut out this back part and you take out that, that tissue. And then you do, again, do the exact same thing on a mounted uh, uh, donor cornea and you transplant this and just put it in the pocket. And in diagrams, it looks really, really good. Well, what I'm gonna show you is the, the very first case ever done in the United States, that's the second case in the world of endothelial keratoplasty, um, and how this was truly a tough operation. I showed this at the Academy in 2000. The pre operative bridge counter millimeter incisions was made 1.0 millimeter superior to the limbus of the body down the 9. So 9 millimeter incision. I've edited this video. It was about a three hour operation. A staff incision is made through the limbus into the anterior chamber. In this patient study, Elon has been injected into the anterior chamber. The film chamber and made some pressure. This is the Devers dissector. And it's a blunt tip dissector. It's not sharp, it's semi-sharp. And total lamellar dissection, limbus to limbus. So I'm about 100 microns above the endothelium here. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. The tree line is entered into the lamellar pocket. It can sometimes be a tight fit. Now this is called the Terry tree fine, so I did name one instrument after myself. And I wanted to create an instrument that would be like a tree fine for penetrating keratoplasty. So that ring is inside the cornea. Elon can be seen to exit from a superior room. The tree fine is gently removed. You guys hear what the video, the, the audio. And these are the first iteration of the Cindy scissors. These scissors take us. These, these were modified on scissors, which we continue to develop. And I wanted to show the academy that you could take out the back part and still leave the surface untouched. To check for uniformity of cut and edge smoothness. That's the back part of the cornea. Used to completely evacuate the elon from the anterior chamber and the pocket. And Paula Owsley was my my technician, so I named this after her because she was with me <laughs> a lot of those days and nights. So that's all, that's, there's no microkeratome. That's just hand dissected. We put it on Helon. The Alsic spatula is brought into the operative field with air in the anterior chamber. It is gently inserted through the pocket into the anterior chamber and brought anteriorly until the donor and recipient entities are here. And the spatula is gently retracted out of the eye right on the layer of Helon, protecting the endothelium. Air is immediately injected into the anterior chamber to stabilize the tissue if it is compressed and the pressure is normalized. Look at all those sutures. Immediate post operative tomography is taken out of a very round. This patient's post operative recovery was quite rapid. And here we see on post op day 13 that the central graft and the was working quite nicely with a clear graft and a very stable interface. Indeed, the central cornea is clearer than the peripheral recipient tissue. The superior wound is healing nicely, and the compressive forces of the limbal sutures diminished considerably by the third week. 
the Netherlands for its original work in development of this procedure, and we recommend his landmark article published in the journal Cornea in 1998. So, you know, that procedure took three hours, okay? And it was not easy at all, uh, but I'd done a couple hundred on IBAC eyes before I ever did my first patient. And it took a year to get it through the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, because they, they said, how, you know, how, how many times has this operation been done uh, in Oregon? I said, well, not, never. And they said, well, how about, how about down in UCSF or Stanford? They've done it down there, right? And I said, well, no, not really. And they said, well, how often has it been done in the United States? I said, well, this will be the first case. And they said, well, how often has it been done in the world? And I said, well, not yet. <laughs> and so they said, so this is experimental surgery. I said, yes, it is. And I said, but I encourage you to go this path. And I'll, here's my 10-page consent form that I have for my patients to protect them and protect their rights. And it took a year, but finally they said, okay, you do one case. So a lot was right in that one case. And when I presented that case to, um, uh, to the Academy, that same video that you just saw, um, it, it really blew them away because they'd never seen the back part of the cornea taken out and uh, replaced and have the patient see 20, 40 vision in just two weeks after surgery, 13 days. It was, it was truly remarkable. And I was very lucky that the tissue worked because you never know with corneal transplants, living tissue, right? So anyway, so uh, uh, John Wilkins, one of my colleagues was with me to assist and then Paula Owsley here. Um, and uh, so we were off and running, okay? So we didn't know uh, if, it, we thought we'd, it would work. Okay, we thought it would work, but we didn't know for sure. And we didn't know how long it would last. And so this is one of my patients. I saw this patient about uh, uh, a year ago and um, uh, 20 years after surgery of a DELEC. And look at this giant incision here. Um, her vision was 2025. She had three doctors of astigmatism, which was flat in the vertical meridian called against the rule of astigmatism because of this big incision. And her cell count was 708. And it's been that way, 500, 600, 700 around there for the last 20 years. Okay, so these graphs last. Um, out of the first uh, 100 cases that I did, the average age was 77 uh, on those patients. And so all but about six patients are still living and, um, and they're doing well. So it's, it's remarkable that uh, this ever worked. Okay, so I had, I had patients that were seeing, you know, 20, 40 at just, uh, you know, two weeks after surgery, three weeks after surgery. And they got even better vision. Their best vision came in about two months, but not two years like in penetrating keratoplasty. They never, none of the patients needed a, uh, a, a gas permeable contact lens, and often they didn't even need spectacles to see well, but only about 8% achieved 2020 vision. And we were getting great 2020 vision on most corneal transplants if they wore a full thickness or if they wore a, a, a contact lens over their full thickness transplant. Um, but the thing is that we didn't understand back then was uh, that the quality of vision was just as important to the patient, if not more so than the clarity of the vision, if you can uh, put your head around that. Um, so the, 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 the uh, clarity of the transplant tissue is not as important to the patient as the curvature of that cornea. And the, and the more natural the curvature is, the better the quality of vision and the better that they, they'll, they'll like it. Um, so we had much better quality of vision. The rejection rate, this surprised us, the rejection rate, uh, the paper I, I published two years after the, the first cases, it was only 9%. And that was compared to 18% in penetrating keratoplasty. And that surprised the heck out of us. And the anthocell cell loss was comparable to penetrating keratoplasty. You know, but so once I showed this at the academy, it, the people started coming in to see the patients to really believe it, put their hand in the wound to, to figure out was this real or not real. And, um, uh, and they, they, they were amazed. They said, well, this is great. Yeah, but it's, this operation was still technically difficult. Um, you could lose the tissue if you screwed up with the dissection of the donor and you perforate too soon, you, you destroy the tissue. Now, what are you going to do? Uh, the interface, uh, uh, the interface healing limited the vision to about 2030. There was no pre-cut tissue. And the time to do surgery was too long and reimbursement was too low. You know, what I found is that it's really it's hard to get patients. It's hard to get surgeons to do surgery on their patients if they don't get paid for doing the surgery. You know, it just, it's weird that way. You know, they like to get paid for doing their work. So when you asked all these surgeons, I, I had 70 surgeons that came to visit me 
Uh, and I didn't charge them anything. I took them out to dinner. I tried to convince them that this was the way to go. And um, uh, they said, Mark, you know, we absolutely agree with you that this is better than penetrating keratoplasty. You're onto something. This is really something that's great. But it's not an easy procedure and it's not very fast. Okay, so how do you get surgeons to change what they're doing? It's not always about make, doing it better for, the, better for the patient. It's other issues as well. Eric Mellis, again, in 2004, came out with a breakthrough innovation. And that was that you don't have to take out a pocket of posterior tissue and put in a, a tissue to fit in that pocket. You can simply just strip off decimase membrane. And then you can take that same tissue, that hand dissected tissue, and you can put it behind there and it'll suck on its own without being in a pocket. And then the, and he called it desmetorexis. And then Price, um, uh, Frank Price in Indiana um, showed methods of removing the interface fluid uh, in, from the procedure called now decimase stripping endothelial keratoplasty. And then Mark Gorovoy down in Florida uh, used a microkeratome to prepare the donor and he called it decimase stripping automated endothelial keratoplasty. But there were real problems with this new procedure in that the dislocation rate at the time was anywhere from 10 to 50%. The primary graft failure was six to 25%. And there were patients that were losing all their vision from pupillary block because with DELEC, I didn't have to put a big air bubble in there. So I didn't, never got pupillary block, never. The air bubble would always float away from the pupil. Um, but they were putting in large air bubbles and blocking the pupil and getting pupillary block. So we, we, we started switching about 2005 uh, at our place um, uh, to DESEC and then to DESEC. And what we found was, why is my tissue sticking with no air bubble support with DELEC? And I think it's because of the, of the physical interaction between the stromal fibers that I've dissected on the, on the recipient and the stromal fibers of the donor tissue. And those two fibers are kind of floating around there. And when you put them together and squish them together, it's almost like a Velcro. They hang on to each other, physically hang on until the endothelium wakes up from its hibernation from, from the IVAC. And so what we decided to come up with was scraping the peripheral cornea here and creating these little fibers and leaving the central area for vision clear with no scraping. And when we did that, and we published a couple of papers on this, this location rate ended up being 1.5%, three cases out of 200, as opposed to the 20 to 50% that everybody else was publishing. We also decided that um, just putting the tissue in, um, uh, folding it in half was not a good idea because the tissue could flip upside down. So we created this idea of putting a taco in there and folding it uh, or rolling it either way uh, so that you could always be sure that you have more on top than the bottom. And then when you unfold it, it's, uh, you're not gonna worry about it being upside down. And then we use smaller bubbles because we had the scraping here. We could then have bubbles, bubbles that were smaller and so we had zero cases of pupillary block in our first 200 cases. So we were, I think we were on to something to make it better. And so this idea of the DESEC uh, surgical technique versus DESEC is where hand dissected donor put it into an, a, a thing that you just strip off decimase membrane, still using a scleral approach though. And DESEC is simply cutting the donor with a microkeratome instead of doing hand dissection. And believe me, that made it so much easier. The hardest part of this delect surgery was making a uh, uh, hand dissection and trying to be in the same plane. Even with the, the Devers dissector and other instruments we had, it still was hard surgery. Okay, I'm gonna show you now our standardized DSAC. You all have probably done DSAC or, or at least seen it. And so um, here's what we do. Oh, let me see. I'm gonna go back here, I think. Yes, okay. So this is our, our standardized to stake surgery uh, since 2004. Now, how do we get, there we go. Okay, so this doesn't have any audio. So I still make a scleral incision. I still make it five millimeters on a scleral incision. And then we do a FACO through that same incision, mark the surface, and then use that as a template to use a, a, a hook to take out the decimase membrane, scrape the periphery, it's kind of an ice scraper device. Make sure the incision is enlarged to five millimeters. Take out the uh, um, viscoelastic, put in some myocol to constrict the pupil. And then this is uh, a tissue that's already had a microkeratome cut. We punch it out with a tree fine from the posterior surface, put a layer of helon on there, and then fold it over into a 4060. And then 
grasp it with some Charlie insertion forceps, put it inside the eye. And these are non-coapting forceps, so they only touch at one point. Unfold the tissue, sweep out the interface fluid with a Cindy sweeper from center to periphery. Put uh, one or two sutures in the uh, scleral wound of Bicral, close the conge, and reduce the, uh, uh, the bubble to about a five, five millimeter bubble. Okay, so going from PK then to Dulec and now to Desake, that's what did the trick because now the surgery was easier than Dulec. And then several of us in the EBA worked with the Academy to get a new code for EK, transplant tissue, because there was no code. So it was hard to get paid for it. And this was, then got Medicare approval. And this was a huge issue. But even bigger than that was probably the fact that no longer did the, the surgeons have to prepare their own tissue. Okay, the surgeons now could have the eye bank prepare the tissue. And so you didn't have to own a microkeratome and have it in the operating room and then pass the microkeratome across and create your donor tissue because you could lose the donor tissue if you, uh, if, if you screwed up. So now you didn't have to worry about losing the tissue because the eye bank did all the work and all you had to do was put it inside the eyeball. Okay. Which brings us to the point of the eye bank revolution. So eye banking, I don't know how many of you are familiar with eye banking, but it used to be that eye banking was simply somebody get called in the middle of the night and a technician would go out there and they would go to the intensive care unit and somebody has died and their, their family said, okay, you can take the eyes. And they would denucleate the eyes, put them into a, a moist chamber and then bring it back and put it in the refrigerator. And then they would give it to the surgeon. That was eye banking back in the day. And then they began processing by simply not taking the whole eye, but just taking off the corneal scleral cap and now they could send that in, in, in a storage solution, transport solution, and then they could give that to the, the surgeon. But EK changed everything about eye banking. Now, eye banks not only were people that harvested tissue and stored the tissue, but they also processed the tissue. And it's gone further and further and further. And now it's just, it's amazing what the eye banks are doing in terms of processing tissue. And when they started processing the tissue, it was very beneficial to our patients because now we didn't have to worry about some doctor screwing up the tissue in the operating room trying to do an EK. It was very beneficial to surgeons because now they didn't have the stress of that. And it was financially advantageous because the eye bank could raise their rates for the processing tissue. And that money then could be used for further research in eye banking to make even greater strides and also for, for, um, uh, for the advancement of science. But remember this slide was you know going from PK to Delec, okay? So from the surgeon's perspective, going from to say uh, from the sake versus PK or Delec, they'd say about the sake, hey, it's easier, it's faster, it's better. That was key, because surgeons aren't going to change their behavior just because it's better for the patient. I mean, they should, right? I mean, if it's better for your patient, you move heaven and earth. But people are people, and surgeons are people, and they. Some of them don't think they are, but you know, it's one of those things where, where you don't have to move hope, heaven and earth. You could, if it's easy and fast, you can just go ahead and, 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 and change, your, change your ways. One of the other big things that was uh, great about uh, this sake is that it could be done for all forms of quote unquote, compensation, all these different uh, categories. And we did the first pediatric case um, of uh, anthel replacement uh, that was successful in the United States. And this is a case that I give long-term follow-up. This is a little girl that I did seven years old and she was about 2,200 from CHED in both eyes. And here she is at post-op at 10 years after her uh, DSAIC and her vision is 20, 30 plus. She has no cataract, okay? I mean, she's a little girl and I did, we replaced the back surface of her eye and put her on steroids for a year. And she has no cataract. Look how clear that is. And she's 20, 30, but now I'm going to blow your socks off. Okay, you ready? <clears throat> this is her 10 year, 10 year cell count after the sake. Now, to keep this in perspective, look at your adult patients at 10 years after penetrating keratoplasty, endothelial keratoplasty, whatever you want to call it, we're replacing endothelium. Your adult patients will have cell counts around 600, 500, 400. This little girl's got a cell count of 2,700 in the right eye and 2,500 in the left eye. I mean, this blew my socks off. 
why this look? And I have another pediatric patient, same thing, 2,200 cells, 2,300 cells. And what this is telling me, and what I need you all to think about when you get into your academic careers, is, is, is it the environment of the endothelial cells that's keeping this, these cell counts high? I think it is. I think that the pediatric environment is so healthy that it's, it's like growing a garden with, you know, with a lot of, lot of fertilizer. <laughs> that sounds terrible. Like a lot of shit that's going to help you. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's, oh, this may be recorded. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? It's, you know, this is amazing. And, and I don't know the answer to this, but I, I suspect it's because the environment, and we need to find out what that environment is. Because if we know what's going on in these little kids' eyes with their aqueous, then we, then we might be able to get our adults doing the same thing. Okay, and this then answers, um, let me get on Chris's here. About Paxton, remember Paxton, a little, little boy that can't see his mother's face because, and we were, didn't want to do a penetrating keratoplasty on him. So we did an ethyl keratoplasty, went from this to this in 12 months, did both eyes. And his whole world's changed, mother's too. So once it became faster, easier, better, okay, um, the use of ethyl keratoplasty started at zero. And I really had a bone to pick with the EBA on this. They said that endothelioplasty started in 2005. No, it started in 2000, okay. But there was only one guy doing it, <laughs> and then two guys doing it, and then three guys doing it. Uh, and finally, when, when there was enough people doing it by 2005, then they started keeping their stats. But look at this, this is penetrating keratoplasty um, back in 2005, this is EK. And then it wasn't until 2011 that it crossed. Okay, so finally, Finally, at 2011, 11 years after we started this journey, surgeons said, yeah, this is better and I can do it. And now it's the most common thing. Well, what about DEMEC? Okay, Desmase membrane and ethyl keratoplasty. Once again, the OCTs show you that this OCT, if I showed you this one from a DEMEC and showed you a normal eye that had no surgery, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It looks exactly the same. So the primary reasons, why should surgeons learn how to do DEMEC? There's still a lot of surgeons that are doing DSAIC instead of DEMEC. The reason is, is that DEMEC represents exact anatomic replacement, okay? God and evolution, 2 million years, three million, 5 million years of evolution and God know best. And the two of those are not mutually exclusive. You always should strive as a surgeon to put the eye or the heart or the kidney back to where it's supposed to be, what God and nature has, has designed. If you can do that, then you are going to have the best results for your patients. You know, it's, it's a crazy idea to put an eye well in front of the iris, right? Why? Because that's not where it's supposed to be, okay? And so it's a crazy idea to take a lump of tissue and put it on the back of the cornea with endothelium and expect that to give you the great vision, it's called to sec or to sake, um, because that's not the way the eye is built. The eye is built with just a membrane on the back. And that's why DEMEC works better than DSAIC. You get better visual results, faster visual recovery. This was another surprise. Wow, less than 1% rejection rate. That was, blew us away. A corneal transplant that has less than 1% rejection rate is because you're replacing just a thin layer and the antigenic load is so low. So this is 2021 EBA statistical report and um, PKs account for 34% still of the transplants. PKs are 63%. And so that, that graph has continued to divide. So this is still bothersome. The popularity of DEMEC in the United States, the total EK, endothelial keratoplastic procedures, is a little over 3,000 now. But look at this. The SAIC is 53%. And the MEC is 47%. That makes no sense. Makes no sense. It, it, it's been published. I mean, everything's out there. The MEC is a better procedure than the SAG. Well, we started doing the MEC in 2009. And after watching the slow acceptance of the MEC versus the SAG, I, I wrote an editorial and I sent it in to Cornea and ask the question, why aren't we all doing DEMEC? And I asked the question that I, I started this talk with is why do surgeons do what they do? 
when presented with various options for surgical therapy to a given ocular pathology, why do surgeons choose one approach, whereas others choose an entirely different approach? Is superior visual outcome the deciding factor, or are there other factors? Are all these reasons patient-oriented? Okay. So they, uh, <laughs> the Cornea Society uh, called me up and said they were going to give me an award for this, um, uh, for this editorial as the best paper of the year. And I said, oh, that's really great. I'm so excited about that. And they said, so how old are you? I said, why do you ask? Well, the award's given for people under 40, published the best paper of the year. I said, I could be 40. <laughs> so I lost that award, but it was, <laughs> so anyway, but uh, uh, the, 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 the thing I was trying to get at is why do surgeons change their mind about how they're going to practice? Okay. And when I asked surgeons their perspective on Demek versus Desake, okay, Demek versus Desake, remember, PK versus Delect, Delect, and okay. From the surgeon's perspective, Demek versus the sake, they said, oh yeah, Mark, it's, it's better. It's definitely better for the patient, but it's not easy and it's not fast. Okay, so same thing. It's held up for 20 years. So we've been dedicated at Devers LVG, Alliance Vision Gift, and other places around the country to make it easier, faster, and standardized. So now for Demek, you've got pre-strip tissue, you've got an S or an F stamp provided by the eye bank to help you know the orientation of the tissue. Uh, Dr. Cruz at Cruz a out of uh, uh, Germany has shown us some things. Stryko, Mike Stryko, my partner, has developed a beautiful glass injector. Uh, uh, Edville York out of Germany as well. Uh, no bubble tapping technique. And, and Jose Guell uh, from Spain has uh, uh, taught us that SF6 works better. So you can take ideas from all over the world now, uh, especially that are generated by the enthylkeratoplasty group, the EKG, and we can get them into a standardized technique. So I don't know if we can make this uh, uh, any easier for surgeons. Okay, so the eye bank now will uh, take the corneal scleral cap, they'll strip decimase membrane off for you. So strip, pre-strip it. They'll then pre-stain it and they'll stain it for you. And then they'll, and they'll trephinate it for you, get to the size you want. And then they'll load it up for an injector for you and then they'll transport it to you in these containers in Optisol. And all you got to do is inject it inside the eye. That's a far cry from Delex surgery, let me tell you. Okay, but when, I, when we started working on, on pre-strip, pre-loaded, all this stuff, um, I told the eye bank, we need to validate this. We can't, we can't say, okay, it works when we, when we walk the tissue over to Mark Terry's operating room and he injects the tissue. I want to know what happens to this tissue if we send it to Germany or if we send it to Hong Kong or if we send this tissue or all, anywhere in the world. I want to know, is that that, that uh, uh, container going to hold up? Is that tissue going to be okay? Is, the, uh, is that little very fragile glass tube going to break? I said, what I want to have is I want to have a gorilla test, okay? I want to know uh, with extreme shipping, what happens to that container and the tissue. And imagine if the preloaded tissue was the same as in this luggage commercial. So when I was growing up, well, actually it's not, it's when I was a grown man, this came out in the seventies, okay? And this was a commercial about the best luggage there could be. And I said, I want, I want this container we're shipping to be the best luggage. So we got to do the same thing as they would do with the luggage. Brutal cab drivers, ruthless porters, baggage masters, and all other painted luggage handlers all over the world. American tourists, imagine getting a suitcase for 20 bucks, right? Okay, so I said, I want a gorilla test. That you can't have fun in research, okay? So so that's what that's what we did. We did a gorilla test. Well, you didn't get really a gorilla. And by the way, that was a chimpanzee, not a gorilla. This is a staircase drop test. Oops. <laughs> and inside that box are four tissues, okay? Loaded up in their in their fragile glass. So that we did the, the staircase drop test. Yep. Let me see another one. Okay. Then we did the disgruntled eye bank employee test. <laughs> Just got fired. Screw this place. 
this is the same box, by the way, that got dropped down the stairs. And now it's being kicked around by disgruntled. The ultimate test for the four tissues that were in there is the rooftop drop. Same box. Okay. There it is in slow motion, which I think is kind of cool. You transplant these? <laughs> so let me show you what happened to these. So these are the four tissues. This is the final result. After all that trauma, the only thing that happened was you got bubbles forming, you know, from in the, in the solution. But the tubes hold, uh, held up, the tissue stayed in a double scroll formation. It all looked great. That was tissue number one, tissue number two, tissue number three, and tissue number four. So no matter what we did in the shipping container, and that's a pretty good gorilla test, dropping it off two stories. Um, we didn't damage the tissue. We didn't, and we did endothelial cell counts on this and looked great. This, this is tissue not you know, suitable for transplantation because it has AIDS or it has hepatitis or something like that. So, um, but um, it, it, it worked, okay? So we knew that we could ship this anywhere in the world. Okay, so making Demec even easier and faster is, is preloaded tissue. I don't know if I, I don't think this is the video on it. Okay. So you ask, well, what about your, what about preloaded tissue? If it, if it goes through a lot of stuff like this, if it goes through shipping problems, can it be used? And yes, it can. We looked at 546 eyes. Um, our primary graft failure rate was 1%. Our rebubble rate was 13%. And cell loss at three months was this, 26. Six months was 28 to 32. The scroll tightness, we measure how, uh, how tight the scroll is, and the time done scroll uh, was about average three minutes. Let me show you how we do our standardized DMEC. So we make a corneal incision now because we've got it down to less than three millimeters. Inject the tissue. And you try and get the tissue opened a little bit as, after you've got it inside the eye by giving short spurts to the uh, inside of the scroll. Keeping the chamber shallow is critical to the surgery. And uh, um, shallow in the chamber, shallow in the chamber. And shallow in the chamber also helps to open up the, uh, the tissue because you've got an egress of fluid that pulls the edges open. So even before we've taken the injector out, we got the tissue mostly unscrolled. And then you always guard the wound before you come out. But that's preloaded tissue. Compare this to the video I showed you of the three hour operation of a DELEC, and it's come a long way. So why people are saying this is a tough procedure, I don't know, because it's, it's very standardized now. And we've got whole lectures on that. This is the same eye that I just showed you three weeks post-op, the vision without glass was 2020 plus one. 70% of Fuchs dystrophy eyes get 2020 vision after surgery at some point post-op. So we've come as far as we can go with surgery for endothelial replacement, but there's really an uncertain future for endothelial keratoplasty. Uh, now that we have antitoxin replacement surgery, what could possibly be better than that? Well, surgery with no transplant. You could do surgery and, and get the endothelium to function, but not have a transplant, you avoid steroids. And avoid steroids, you're, you're avoiding a lot of complications that can occur. Ask our glaucoma people. Surgery without a transplant for Fuchs dystrophy uh, was first done by Randleman uh, by surprise. He did a, 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 a PPMD patient and stripped the cornea and, and uh, uh, tissue didn't stick and it cleared spontaneously. Steve Koenig uh, stripped uh, up in um, uh, Wisconsin, stripped uh, over, greater than six millimeters and uh, they did not clear. And then Kathy Colby, when she was in Chicago, uh, she started stripping four millimeters and found that they cleared. 10 out of 13. The problem that we had was two weeks or months, but it took weeks or months for the cornea to clear. And there was no guarantee on any individual patient that would clear. And the final central cell counts uh, ended up very low. Um, but nonetheless, you know, if you start off with a Fuchs dystrophy here and you strip and it fills in, you can get very clear corneas um, uh, at three months. And then the use of, uh, uh, you know, rokinase inhibitors, rock inhibitors, um, has uh, accelerated this aspect of taking out the endothelium without 
replacing it with a transplant. As long as you do a small area and you use the rokinase inhibitor for at least a couple of weeks, uh, you can get most of these Fuchs dystrophy patients to clear, but it has to be a small area still and it doesn't work in pseudophagic bullous scare top the ACI walls, et cetera. Um, but what's even better than that? Okay, no surgery at all, right? And, you know, it, it's been, uh, Shigeru Kinoshita has uh, been the one that has led this struggle for the last 10 years in um, trying to use a drop to get the endothelium to mitose and to spread. And instead of using, stripping out decimase membrane, what he would do is freeze the central cornea and then, um, uh, and then put the patient on drops and the drops themselves uh, would, reach, would cause the peripheral endothelium to spread centrally and cover the defect. And he's had success with that. Um, here it is with the pre-op central bulli, transcornal freezing using the, the rock inhibitor and then getting cell counts one month post-op. Uh, and look at, the, look at the central corneal thickness, uh, 703 and then 607 post-op at just uh, uh, one month. All right. So, you know, I'm taking on a journey over the past, uh, you know, about an hour here um, of the evolution of corneal transplantation. And it really has been astonishing how quickly this has occurred. Remember, we, we were 100 years doing full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. And in just 22 years, we've come an awful long way. The MEC does represent pure anatomic replacement surgery and takes us as far as surgery can go. And the current standardization of surgical procedure, I mean, we've got you know, our technique of doing it and it works and we can teach that and we can even have people watch the videos and learn from the videos well enough to do the surgery with confidence. So I think that the MEC should be full, fully accepted by transplant surgeons. I hope that in the next few years, we'll get past that that uh, uh, disparity between DSAC and DMEC and that uh, uh, DMEC will uh, dominate uh, anything replacement surgery. But I'm gonna give you a couple final thoughts for the residents and fellows. And this is personal. You know, the big ideas, okay? The big ideas, the ones that are really game changers, think about FACO, think about EK, they don't come out of the laboratories of very large universities, prestigious universities. Um, they come from individual people because surgery is about individual people, okay? And it's if the individual surgeon is unhappy about something and he becomes passionate, he or she becomes passionate about it, then they're the ones that make the big changes, okay? And I, I think that each of you have to recognize that you can make a difference. You know, you're, you're right now, you're, you're being loaded with all this information from all these incredible mentors. Um, but once you get out of here, you're gonna be either in private practice or you're gonna be in a hybrid like I am, or you're gonna be in a full university. And it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are if you're gonna make a difference in your field. If you have something that bugs the heck out of you in clinic and you, you think about it and think about it, think about it, you can come up with an idea and develop an, a, a procedure or medicine or something like that that is going to change the field and change it forever. It's about the individual, it's not about the university. So, you know, don't question whether you can make a difference because, you know, you can. Don't be afraid to innovate. So, you know, it, it takes a lot, of, a lot of guts to do something like Charlie Kelman did, stick this vibrating tip into an eye and try and take out this nucleus of the lens. I mean, he killed a lot of corneas. But on the other hand, he also advanced the field of, corne of, of cataract surgery dramatically. So don't be afraid to innovate, but don't be a cowboy either. I mean, one of the most despicable things about ophthalmology is that we can do whatever we want under the, under the guise of, of practice of medicine, uh, but you should always be protecting your patients. And the only way to protect your patients is with, a, if you have an innovative surgery, is with an IRB, Institutional Review Board, okay? You need somebody else to say you're doing the right thing. You need to have a consent form that is that lays out the patient, hey, I've never done this before, <laughs> okay? Don't try it out on somebody because would you want somebody to try out their surgery on you? Every patient is your father, is your mother, is your sister, is your brother. So <laughs> make sure you protect your patient against you and your passion of doing something. 
you know it's the right thing, but protect your patient with an IRB, protect your patient with a consent form, let them be honest with your patients. And, and then you will, you will truly be doing the right thing. So I don't know if you know, but every time I give a talk, I always thank the people that are, are, are most important for me. Uh, my son, Charlie, my son, Nicholas, this is the guy I almost dropped on his head. And, uh, uh, and his lovely wife, Cindy. Uh, Cindy's with me here in Kentucky because she's never been here either. And, and we're just looking forward to a nice time. But uh, I always thank them for letting me be here and taking the time away from them when I was developing this thing. And I thank you guys for your kind attention. Thanks a lot. <laughs>